Turkey relationship covers everything from en uh, enlargement negotiation to the current massive issue of Turkey's role in, in the European and uh, Middle Eastern migration crisis, but also covers issues like uh, the relationship between Turkey and Cyprus, which is a, a huge issue and one which is being negotiated at the moment and which could uh, develop in a positive way in, in, in uh, months ahead, which would uh, be very significant for the whole future development of, of uh, the European relationships in that part of the world. So without any further ado, Simon, perhaps you could get us going and uh, bring us up to date in the simple tasks that you conduct for the, the Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I think of all the daunting tasks I've faced this year, the one that's worried me the most is how to present the complexity of the EU-Turkey relations and recent developments while respecting the 15 to 20 minute time slot I've been given. Um, I'll do my best, but I'm sure we'll have plenty of space left for question and answers and an exploration of some of the other avenues of this complex uh, and um, um, detailed relationship. Let me start by saying that on the 15th of July, uh, Turkey witnessed a, a direct attack on its democracy, um, symbolised by the shelling of the Grand National Assembly. And I sometimes ask myself, how would I as a British citizen have felt if the Royal Air Force had bombed the House of Commons? And I think that's a question that at times is worth asking ourselves because it explains and allows us to better understand the profound shock of this coup on the Turkish population and perhaps why some of the Turkish politicians felt that the necessary empathy and understanding was not always shown by their European Union counterparts. I think we have to be clear, this was an unacceptable act in any country in the world, and the EU was also amongst the very first actors to condemn the coup attempt, um, while at the same time expressing as well its um, solidarity with the democratic institutions in Turkey. There have been a very large number of visits in the recent weeks to Turkey. I myself have been to Turkey three times in the last four weeks with uh, Commissioner Avramopoulos, President Schulz, um, Commissioner Hahn, uh, High Representative Vice President Mogherini. We've also had contacts at the presidential level. Um, and this has, I think, already uh, intensified what was a, a very high frequency of high-level visits to, uh, from the EU to Turkey in the last 12 months. I think what we've seen in the last um, period is um, bringing back onto uh, a track or a, a, a level of engagement the EU-Turkey relations, which we'd not seen for many, many years, certainly not since uh, 2007. This has in part been triggered by the migration crisis, and I, I intend to devote a fair amount of my short time today to also talking to you a bit about where are we on the EU-Turkey migration statement, the implementation, what does this imply, what is the real state of this? Um, but let me start perhaps by taking a step back into history, because I think it's worthwhile just framing the EU-Turkey relationship by looking at um, the stage of our development. Um, Turkey is a candidate country for EU membership. We opened accession negotiations in 2005, so that's some 11 years ago. Um, they initially progressed reasonably well, um, but we've seen them actually effectively almost stall in recent years. So if we take a snapshot of where we are today, we've seen 16 chapters opened, out of which only one is provisionally closed. And we're also not able to close chapters at the moment because that is one of the consequences of the decision taken by all the member states as a response to Turkey's failure to implement what we call the additional protocol, but which in simple terms means Turkey is not effectively um, recognising or allowing at least the customs union to be extended, the benefits of the customs union to the Republic of Cyprus. But there are reasons over and beyond um, um, this which explain why the accession process has not necessarily um, progressed as fast as we would want. First is quite clearly the unresolved Cyprus issue. Um, Cyprus joined the European Union in 2004 as a divided island. Um, unfortunately, in the referendum on the Annan Plan at that time, one side voted against. But we've still been left with a, an issue which has constantly impacted on EU-Turkey relations, um, uh, partly, as I said before, because Turkey has continued to deny access to Cypriot vessels, Cypriot airplanes, to its airspace and to its ports. 
Um, I'll come on perhaps later in the presentation to how I assess the current situation in Cyprus and what this might mean. Um, but that had a direct impact on the negotiations in the sense that the European Union also said not only could no chapters be provisionally closed, but eight chapters that were very closely linked with the customs union um, could not be opened with Turkey until Turkey effectively fulfills the commitment it gave at the time of its accession that it would apply the additional protocol and allow vessels and uh, planes from Cyprus to travel to and from Turkey. But in addition to that, we also have a further number of chapters which have been unilaterally blocked by Cyprus, meaning that key areas such as chapters related to the rule of law or also energy are not available for us to be able to, as the European Union, negotiate with um, Turkey. Um, I think it's fair to say also we've seen a, a mixed view or mixed position from some of our member states. We had, during the time uh, of President Sarkozy's time as president in France, particular difficulties with France, who had said, OK, to carry on your accession negotiations, but there are some chapters which you can't open, uh, such as agriculture, regional policy, budget, because we don't want to give the impression um, that this is about Turkey joining the European Union. Uh, I must admit, I've always struggled to understand quite what the purpose of accession negotiations should be if that wasn't the case, but... Um, Never mind. Um, and all of this has, of course, had an impact as well on public opinion in Turkey from very high public support for a European Union membership of Turkey in Turkey in the early 2000s. We've seen that steadily decreasing over time. Uh, and last but not certainly not least, I think we have to also recognise um, that the domestic politics in Turkey and particularly what we have seen at times on areas related to freedom of expression, rule of law, have not always created a climate in which we are comfortable or member states are comfortable in seeing the accession progress, uh, process progress. If you take, for example, our uh, annual reports on uh, candidate countries, uh, we use quite strong language such as backsliding to describe the developments in the area of freedom of expression or the rule of law last year. Um, where we're seeing developments which have actually undermined some of the quite considerable progress we saw from Turkey in the initial years after it became a candidate country. Now, um, but this relationship goes much beyond um, just uh, an accession relationship. One thing I would just quote to give you an example is the importance of trade in our relationship. Um, Turkey is um, a key partner for the European Union. It's our fifth biggest trading partner. But equally, the European Union is a key partner uh, for Turkey. The European Union is Turkey's biggest um, uh, number one import and export partner. 40% of Turkey's trade occurs with the European Union, and 70% of foreign direct investment in Turkey emanates and comes from the European Union. And one of the reasons for this is for now 20 years, we've had a customs union. Um, something perhaps which the British colleagues are now studying carefully to understand what this implies and what it doesn't imply, also in terms of your ability to sign free trade agreements with third partners. Um, and when the customs union was signed with Turkey 20 years ago, it was probably one of the most far-reaching, ambitious trade arrangements that the European Union had ever concluded with a party. I'll give you an example, an industrial good produced in Turkey has today the same access to the single market as an industrial good produced in Dublin. Um, but what we're also seeing is that this trade relationship over time has also been overtaken by developments in the modern world. So whereas the customs union 20 years ago didn't include services, services dominate large parts of our economy today. And one of the things my team are working on at the moment with my colleagues in DG Trade is on a project to upgrade and modernise the customs union, to extend it to the services sector, extend it to public procurement, um, cover agricultural products, and also have an effective dispute resolution mechanism. So that's one of the big axes of work we're seeing at the moment and where we're expecting to, if all goes well, uh, present to the council a uh, proposal for a negotiating mandate still this year. Um, on energy as well, this is another area where we have uh, uh, a huge interest in working together. Turkey quite clearly has the potential to become the primary transit country for energy supply to the European Union and is a, a key strategic partner for us. We've intensified our discussions with Turkey over the last period 
Um, we've seen a lot of work around the Trans-Anatolian gas pipeline bringing the gas from uh, Azerbaijan uh, into the European Union, uh, where Turkey again plays a crucial role and will continue to do so. Uh, it goes without saying that as a foreign policy actor, Turkey is a, a, an important and strategic partner. One only needs to look at the developments in Syria and, and witness the tragic events on an almost daily basis to see that the EU and Turkey working together will be an essential prerequisite for any solution to the Syrian crisis and putting to an end the, uh, the tragic humanitarian disaster we continue to witness. Uh, it also comes back very prominently when we look at the migration crisis where I think it is the moment now to pay tribute to Turkey for hosting in uh, relatively good conditions three million refugees in uh, on its territory. And if we see some of the debate that occurs within the European Union around this, uh, I think it's the right moment to, to pay tribute to that, with Turkey having also taken other courageous decisions, like, for example, opening its labour market to the Syrian refugees, granting them full access to the education services, to the health services, with our support, about which I'll come back to in a moment. Now, I'd like to just to take a, a step back to the migration crisis. If we go back, actually, to around one year ago, we were seeing in the month of September and October up to 10,000 people crossing the Aegean Sea on a night, large numbers of people losing their lives because the smugglers had many interests, but ensuring the safe passage of people was not one of them. And we were, frankly, in a bit of a mess. And as a result of this, I think the uh, cooperation between Turkey and the European to try and solve, European Union to try and solve this intensified. And this culminated in what is called the EU-Turkey <laughs> statement of the 18th of March 2016, which I think was a turning point in breathing some new life into our relations with Turkey, but also into providing the beginnings of a solution together with the closure of the Western Balkan route to the migration crisis that the European Union was faced with. Um, it provided both sides with a, a series of mutual commitments. We on our side uh, agreed to up our support in terms of funding, also work with Turkey to accelerate the visa liberalization process. But it also provided a series of commitments on the Turkish side to effectively stepping up their action to combat the smuggling rings, um, stepping up their action to provide further support to the Syrian refugees on their territory. Now, if you read the European Union press at times, you would probably have the impression that the uh, deal has collapsed, the statement is failing, and everything is not working. Well, actually, that is not at all the case. And I think one of perhaps the best kept secrets in Brussels is that while the statement is still fragile, it needs a lot of love and attention, um, it is still holding up. Let me give you a couple of examples that back that up. As I said before, we were facing up to 10,000 people a night crossing the Aegean Sea. And since the activation of the uh, statement on the 18th of March, the numbers have dramatically fallen. We're now on an average of 94 per day since the, um, since the 18th of March. I think one thing that's also important to, to really underline here is lives have been saved. That's critical. It's not something that we're actually very good at getting across. If you take, for example, the first three months of this year, January to March, before the activation of the statement, 366 people lost their lives crossing the Aegean Sea. Since the activation of this statement on the 18th of March, there have been only 20 deaths. I don't mean by that to suggest that 20 is an adequate figure. It's 20 too many, but it's still a very significant reduction in the number of lives being lost. Um, in one week's time, so that is on the 28th of September, we will publish on the side of the Commission our latest report on the implementation of the statement that will give you an impression of the different strands, including, for example, the uh, return package which allows people to migrate legally from Turkey to the European Union where so far I think just under 1,500 people have been able to move and where work is currently ongoing in finalising what is called the voluntary return scheme to bring to a more significant number of the people who can find a legal path from um, Turkey to the European Union. Let me also just add all of this has been done in full and unequivocal respect of international law. 
on the Greek side, nobody has been returned to Turkey without there having been an individualised based assessment process, which in perhaps part explains why the number of people that have actually been returned under the statement from Greece to Turkey still today is relatively low at around 500 people. I think this is one area where we do need to see improvements in the sense of sending a clear message to the smugglers that a passage to Greece in an irregular manner does not equate to being able to stay in the European Union. Um, where are we on some of the other strands that came about from this, and much of which you will read in the press? Um, let me turn to visa liberalisation. Um, as I said, one of the key commitments in the uh, statement was that the European Union would support Turkey's efforts to fulfil the 72 benchmarks in the visa liberalisation roadmap. I hope you note the clear sequencing, support the efforts of Turkey to fulfil the benchmarks. Today we have around seven benchmarks that still need to be fulfilled. We're working hard with the Turkish um, uh, partners on this. I myself have go very, very frequently to Turkey. I think I've been 23 times this year, both in terms of negotiating the migration statement, helping it um, hold it, uh, and working with our Turkish partners on this. You will have seen perhaps the one that features quite prominent in the press is the discussion about the um, anti-terrorism legislation. Quite clearly, in the, in the midst of the aftermath of the coup, plus also the threats that Turkey continues to face from both ISIS and PKK, this is very sensitive. Um, but I think we have to be also crystal clear what this is about. This is not about reducing Turkey's capacity to fight terrorism, not at all. This is about ensuring that the provisions of the terrorism legislation are not used in a way which stifles freedom of expression and leads journalists, academics and others facing at times quite lengthy pre-trial detention on the basis of what they have said and the views they have expressed. Um, I th I'm fairly confident on my side that with goodwill on both sides there are solutions envisageable that will respect the red lines of both partners. But I just want to also make the point, because again, sometimes you read in the press that there is this date of October by when visa liberalisation must take place. There is no such thing as a deadline to visa liberalisation or a guillotine at which, if Turkey hasn't got visa liberalisation, this prospect fades. This is a process in which we are supporting the Turkey's efforts, but the name of the game is you fulfil the benchmarks and then the Commission will unequivocally confirm that to Council and Parliament who will need to take the decision in accordance with the normal procedures. Let me also turn to a, uh, another point um, on the facility for refugees in Turkey. The European Union committed to providing an initial €3 billion, euro, followed by potentially a further €3 billion euro once the funds have been used up. Again, this is uh, at times something which one reads um, diverging views in the press. Um, let me be crystal clear on this and perhaps put an end to what I would describe as sometimes as the... Monty Python-esque style rhetoric that emanates from parts of Turkey, which seems to have no problem in simultaneously inviting European Union leaders to cut the red tape and inaugurate projects, but then in the same breath claim that not a single euro of funds has arrived. Let me be crystal clear where we are on this. The agreement to establish this facility was reached in February. Today, um, some seven months later, we have already committed around 2.2 billion euro for concrete programmes. And as of last night, we had signed contracts of 700 million euro with over 500 million euro dispersed, concretely spent out on the ground, making a difference. This includes, for example, projects such as the provision of a little credit card to refugees so that with dignity they can take um, control of their own lives and use the funding provided by the European Union to buy food uh, and other such um, items. Um, we're also very close to concluding contracts with the <coughs> Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health, which I'm still fairly confident will make this one this month that will bring over to the total of over one billion euro already contracted in just a few months. I think it's important to stress that and dismiss this image that occasionally crops up that no funds are flowing. That is not correct. Um, one of the other commitments we made in the statement was that we would further advance some of the preparatory work uh, on some of the key chapters. Um, we were able on the 30th of June to open the chapter on financial and budgetary provisions, so-called Chapter 33. 
and my team have also completed a lot of the preparatory work for the opening of other chapters such as energy, um, education and culture, foreign security and defence policy and we're currently in the final stages of preparing some of the preparatory work around the migration, security and rule of law chapters. Um, one of the reasons why these chapters have not been able to be opened is because we uh, are still not able to find unanimity amongst the member states, notably with Cyprus having concerns. Which brings me to a point I want to just make. I think we are facing a uh, historic opportunity to see a settlement on the island. Uh, I was um, very lucky to be able to have lunch earlier this year with the leader of the Turkish Cypriot community, Mr Akinji, and I went home that evening and I said to my family, I think I've had lunch today with somebody who within the next 18 to 24 months I believe will be the Nobel Peace Prize laureate together with his uh, uh, co-leader, the leader of the Greek Cypriot community. I think this is a unique opportunity. I think the negotiation methodology in particular the UN is using, bringing the full ownership of both parties, presents a wonderful chance to bring to an end a, a bitter divide. I think it will also then provide the right moment to have a fresh look at EU-Turkey relations where there should be no impediment to the opening of chapters. I think what is crucial now, therefore, is to keep the engagement. Uh, this is a relationship that matters for both sides and not lose the momentum uh, uh, and not lose the commitment for EU-Turkey relations. But this also involves a necessity for a constructive, open and frank dialogue, including on topics of difficulty or where we have differences of view. And I, I can't end without just mentioning one word of concern on our side. When we witness some of the developments in Turkey after the 15th of July coup, and we look at the number of cases of people who have been arrested or dismissed, um, I think if the latest figures I have are we've seen around um, 40,000 arrests and over 100,000 people dismissed. I think one of the key challenges that Turkey will face is ensuring that each and every individual is able to benefit from a fair trial, a fair process, with respect of the presumption of innocence and a case that is seen and is conducted in accordance with the highest standards of the rule of law. I think this would be a challenge for any of our countries and this of course is something that I think on the side of the European Union, while people have full understanding of the necessity to um, bring to justice the perpetrators of the coup uh, in a, such a process, this will raise many challenges and will be one I think that people will, in our own public opinion, follow very, very closely and is likely also to play a role in determining the future direction of EU-Turkey relations. I'll end there, leaving plenty of space for some time and questions. We are looking forward to hearing from him. The professor is professor of EU studies at the Istanbul Bull Policy Centre, and he has a long and distinguished career working for the United Nations and also a, a, as an academic in his own country. And uh, we welcome him by electronic communication and ask him to speak to us on this huge topic of his country's relations with, with Europe. You're very welcome. I also, in particular, thank the uh, Institute for International and uh, European Affairs, and I greet, of course, my co-panelists, Kevin Conby and uh, Simon, Simon Mordew, as well as the participants. So, um, uh, as a professor of EU studies, uh, I, one of the first things I, I teach my students in general uh, is about the difference be between the various EU institutions. And when I talk about the Commission, I always make the point that the Commission is the best friend and ally of the candidate country, of any candidate country. I think uh, Simon's uh, talk uh, was crystal clear on this sense, and uh, uh, has, he has given a, a perfect uh, illustration of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of a real politique, I would say, uh, how it works nowadays when uh, Turkey has more and more difficulties to cope with the membership obligations. So, uh, I would rather concentrate on the challenges ahead 
Simon Mordew mentioned some of them, but I would like to go in the details uh, of, uh, of these challenges. Um, I, would, I would classify them into two. I mean, the internal challenges, the, 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 the so-called Turco-Turkic challenges, uh, and the external challenges. Uh, the Turkish challenges, uh, I would, I would uh, summarize them in, in one sentence. It is simply non-compliance with the anti communist Act. I mean, Turkey's, uh, uh, Turkish government's uh, uh, practice and policies don't correspond to the acquis communautaire of the European Union anymore since long time. Uh, it's two different things. I will give you some examples. Uh, uh, first, uh, the technical uh, examples. Uh, Simon mentioned the 16 open chapters. 15 uh, are still ongoing. The negotiations are proceeding, I mean, so-called proceeding. One chapter is closed. This is the tiniest one. But uh, the, um, there are two chapters which are of particular interest to the candidate country, Turkey, which are under negotiation. One is the environment chapter. And the other one is the regional policy. They are both open chapters. They are, they are discussed now with the relevant uh, uh, authorities on the both ends. Turkey has tremendous environmental problems. Uh, I will give you just one simple example. The so-called environmental impact analysis doesn't apply in Turkey anymore, by decree and by law. Turkey is negotiating the environment chapter with the European Union. The second uh, in interesting chapter, which is under negotiation, is the regional policy. Well, I mean, we all know what is regional policy and how Ireland benefited from regional policy. How important is the regions in Europe? Well, we have uh, a similar problem in Turkey. And Turkey is an over-centralized country. And one of the uh, requirements of the Kurdish politicians, but not only Kurdish politicians, of, of uh, local politicians from everywhere in this huge country, highly centralized, uh, is a bit of devolution. And although not directly uh, in, uh, in, in connection with the regional policy, that latter policy helps very much, like we have seen in Poland, for instance, or in, in Romania, you know, the uh, kind of decentralization. Well, we are in, uh, in Turkey not decentralizing at all. Actually, we are centralizing more. Uh, it has become, I mean, the Turkish si system of decision making has become person. There is only one person who decides in Turkey, and that is the President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. So, uh, discussion, negotiations, these are all nice words, but uh, these are also, the otherwise, the harsh realities. Uh, Simon mentioned uh, the blocked chapters, uh, eight of them by the Council, the decision, and the remaining ones unilaterally by the Republic of Cyprus. Of four. It's unfortunate, especially for chapter 23 and 24, which are intimately related to the uh, to uh, the political questions. I will come to it. But uh, there are three chapters that no one mentions, not even the website of the Turkish Ministry of EU Affairs. These chapters are social policy, competition policy, and the public procurement. Uh, the, let, let me give you one example for each of these chapters. These chapters are not blocked at all by any member state. And uh, these chapters, nevertheless, don't open. And uh, uh, for a very simple reason, because the Turkish government doesn't wish to open them. As for the social policy, as you all know what means a social policy, uh, Turkey is Europe's uh, record uh, setter in terms of uh, 
in terms of dead workers in the working place. And uh, the, uh, the very uh, law which was pushed by the EU uh, you know, to apply is systematically delayed and in the meantime the death of workers continue unabated. You can go and look at the statistics of ILO uh, which are uh, copied in every progress report, report of the European Commission in, the, uh, in uh, October, November each year. Competition policy, I mean, the, one of the requirements of the EU to open the, this chapter is for the state to stop helping the, the state-owned institutions by subsidies. Well, uh, the Turkish government doesn't want to do that, and the, this chapter cannot be opened. It's one of the opening benchmarks. And the third one is the public procurement. The public procurement is over 100 billion Turkish lira, which is 30, 35 billion euro yearly, huge budget, where the government is, which the government is using uh, to, to uh, you know, on a totally opaque, non-transparent basis to distribute public markets and uh, uh, public procurement totally in, in contradiction with the, with the acquis communautaire and the opening benchmark, which, uh, which, look, which looks for um, uh, you know, a transparent uh, public bidding. It is unfortunately not the case. So I repeat and I underline, these three openable chapters are not even mentioned in the website of the Turkish Ministry of EU affairs. So these are the technical uh, problems related to the acquis. Now let's have a quick look to the political non-compliance. When I say political non-compliance, I, uh, I have in mind the example of, the, of Slovakia and uh, the, the, the one of the former prime ministers of uh, Slovakia Mečiar, who has been uh, summoned uh, by actually the three ambassadors, the French, the, the, the Brit, and the and the German, visited the, this uh, authoritarian prime minister in '98. I remember very well to tell them that if they continue like this, they won't be in the next uh, bunch of the of the candidate countries. And this is exactly what happened. In the meantime, of course, Slovakia had to change. Uh, a government and uh, had to comply with with the uh, with the Copenhagen political criteria. What I mean, what I want to say about this is that Turkey doesn't comply with the Copenhagen political criteria anymore. Everyone knows this. Uh, and uh, if Turkey was not in the negotiation state uh, or stage. Well, I don't think that, that the negotiations would have started with, with uh, this candidate country. So, uh, Simon Mogodu has mentioned some uh, shortcomings in terms of human rights violations. I will skip the, the past human rights violations, especially those related to the Kurdish question. Uh, recently, I mean, the, the over what, uh, over a year now, more than a year since uh, July 2015, uh, there has been uh, widespread human rights violations in the towns and cities inhabited by the Kurdish citizens of Turkey. Uh, entire towns and cities were uh, razed, you know, to the ground and de destroyed. Uh, to start with the uh, the old uh, Christian uh, area of uh, of the Armekir, for instance, the, the Sur uh, uh, neighborhood. I mean, I, I, I won't go into details of it, but I would like to uh, give you some figures which were already mentioned by uh, Simon uh, regarding the dealings of the uh, emergency rule. Now, this emergency rule has been declared, of course, in connection with, uh, with this uh, attempted and thank God aborted coup d'etat. This is perfect. And uh, uh, all these culprits 
all those who have been involved in it sh should be punished. There is no doubt about that. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the authorities have declared the emergency rule just for this. But uh, the, the consequences are, are, are pretty far from, from uh, you know, being fair, at least regarding the fair trial that each and every individual, uh, especially in a candidate country, uh, needs or requires. Hundred, over 100,000 civil servants have been summarily fired, been dismissed, out of which 3,500 judiciary personnel, 43,000, uh, these figures are fresh, I mean, for, from the last weekend, uh, 43,000 people are into custody, uh, and uh, out, of, uh, out of this figure, 24,000 are arrested. Uh, without any any proper trial, and uh, 19 universities were closed, 19, one nine, and uh, as well as 2,100 secondary schools. The reason is that all these education institutions were, in one way or another, related to this movement called Gulen, Gulenist movement, who is. Uh, considered or declared as being behind the aborted coup d'etat. Uh, 1,254 associations and foundations have been uh, closed and their properties have been transferred to the treasury. Um, together with, uh, with the spoliation of uh, the, the goods of companies who are supposed to be related to the Gulenist movement, the figure uh, the economists are now uttering nowadays are 12 billion Turkish lira of uh, property transferred to the treasury. 12 billion, you divide by three, so it makes around 4 billion euros just uh, taken away from individuals without any proper trial, just like, like this, in an Ottoman way. Uh, 160 <laughs> media outlets were shut down, and today uh, there are 122 journalists accused of all sorts of um, uh, wrongdoings who are jailed. This is definitely a record according to the Committee for the Protection of Journalists and Other Human Rights Watchers. Um, the emergency rule will probably continue. The general elections will probably be delayed. Uh, they are already talking about delaying them from 2019 to 2020, which is now not tomorrow. We don't know what is this, hurry, why this hurry, hurry. And there has been 28 Kurdish mayors who have been dismissed uh, but uh, we need local elections to replace them. Uh, no one expects any local election in a, in a foreseeable future. So these are uh, the, uh, the overall situation regarding the internal challenges to the EU, uh, uh, you know, EU relationship. Not only EU relationship, by the way, maybe we, we, we should talk about the Western relationship of the country, including NATO, uh, because we should, I would like to recall that NATO is not just a military organization, but also a political organization since 1949. Well, uh, as for the external challenges, I mean external in the sense that uh, the challenges emanating from Brussels and other EU uh, institutions, uh, uh, when I say other, I have in mind Luxembourg, of course, with, uh, with the European Parliament. Well, I mean, just a few examples. I mean, the, uh, uh, the Commission writes progress reports about Turkey since 1998. Uh, all recent reports were negative, full of little or, uh, or no progress. Uh, regarding the chapters that are opened or those who are not uh, opened. But at least in the past few years ago, there was a bright side, and this bright side was about the Kurdish uh, peace process, the so-called Kurdish peace process. Well, no more. The only 
quote unquote bright side that the, the, the commission can still utter in the in the report is about the, this poor refugee deal. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have time really to, to go into details. Maybe it may come in the in the in the in the, in the Q and A, but. Uh, this is basically where we are in terms of, you know, real politics. Uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, the the Turkey deal or the appreciation of Turkey doesn't, of course, end with the with the with the Commission. Now uh, we all know the, the attitude of President uh, Juncker. Uh, who openly and proudly announced on the 28th of October 2015, very much in connection with the so-called refugee deal, that human rights violations, and of course I'm not quoting him, but I mean this is basically what he said in, the, in front of the European Parliament, human rights violations is not at all his concern or the concern of the Commission. Uh, and because, because uh, the, the, the key issue was the, at the time, the refugee deal, and it still is. The problem is that uh, uh, the, uh, the the Council, I mean, the, the the Council of the European Union, is not at all in the same wave of land, you know, when it comes to Turkey's EU membership. Recently, Austria, as you may know, in the mouth of his prime minister, but not only the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, has announced loudly. Uh, what almost all other capitals are thinking silently, namely uh, uh, to stop the Turkey's, the Turkey's negotiations with the EU. Yeah. Uh, I mean, nothing new there, really. I mean, one should uh, just go and look at the 18 months work plan of the uh, three presidencies, the Netherlands, Slovakia, and Malta, uh, when you go in the enlargement paragraph, there is no mention of Turkey. Uh, so uh, the, the council is talking another, uh, uh, you know, another big, big discourse, another another way. Um, I mean, not to mention, of course, the informal meetings uh, that are taking since months now here and there, where uh, the freeze and uh, the, the total end of the negotiations are discussed. <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, uh, the, the relationship, uh, if we put as, aside the, uh, the refugee deal, or uh, which is also part of it actually, you know, uh, the, the relationship between the EU and the uh, European Union has become an ad hoc cooperation actually, exactly like for any other third country. I mean, the EU, if it has a problem with Egypt or Saudi Arabia, tackles this, you know, on an ad hoc manner. You know, doesn't go into details of the human rights violations in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt or whatsoever. So, I mean, this is, I mean, just to give you a, an illustration of it, on the 9th of, uh, uh, I think, uh, September, yes, uh, it's a few, few days ago, Mogherini and Han, were in town. I mean, they were in, in Ankara. They met the people, and uh, when they were in town, 11,301 uh, uh, college uh, professors have been summarily dismissed. And these 28 elected Kurdish mayors that I just mentioned 10 minutes ago or seven uh, in the Kurdish towns have been dismissed as well no mention whatsoever. Very, you know, slight, uh, you know, um, remarks uh, here and there, yeah. but uh, clearly no, uh, you know, no, no big deal, you know, coming from the European uh, uh, representatives. So I think uh, Turkish liberals and Democrats have extreme difficulties to, un uh, to understand the uh, some of the European Union institutions' position. And they feel literally abandoned. Uh, and they, uh, everyone knew that, that, that uh, you know, the EU had no leverage whatsoever on, on EU on the transformation and the change process of the country like 10 years ago. Uh, but 
but I mean to reach such a stage of real quality is is considered as very much deceiving. And I will just uh, mention one very latest uh, opinion poll. Uh, Turkish public opinion always was always pro-European, but on the, on the same time, the Turkish public opinion was, you know, uh, uh, I would say clever enough or, or you know, uh, sharp enough to consider that, that you know, this uh, membership would never happen. So the, those who considered that the membership would never happen has risen to 70% now, 70, 70, which is, which is, which just really reflects, unfortunately, the reality. So uh, just one uh, last word about, uh, about this, uh, you know, the actual situation where uh, anybody who, uh, who doesn't please the government or the, the top leaders of the country, you know, is, is, uh, is uh, potentially, uh, you know, in the, in the danger of being arrested. As we are talking now, uh, Ahmet Altan and Mehmet Altan, two top Turkish intellectuals, you know, had been uh, meeting with the, with, the, with the police officers who were questioning them. I understand that they, were, they haven't answered their questions because they were accused of some obscure uh, subliminal connection with the Gulenist movements. Nevertheless, I will just uh, end up by, uh, by, by, by quoting the, uh, some of the names of 288 world intellectuals who have signed a petition for them. Kotzi, Hertha Müller, Julian Barnes, Bretenbach, Peter Carey, Chomsky, Edgar Morin, Antonio Negri, Arundhati Roy, Emma Thompson, Judith Butler, John Berger, Salman Rushdie, and Günther Walder. I stop there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Kevin Conley is Director for Western Europe in the Europe Division of Foreign Affairs. He is someone who has served this country in, in Washington, in London, in San Francisco, and in the United Nations in New York, and has been involved also in, in the Northern Ireland peace process over the years. And uh, we look forward to hearing the, the view from Ivy House. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I welcome the opportunity uh, to set out uh, the Irish government's uh, policy on Turkey as a contribution to today's discussion. I just want to start by thanking the Institute uh, for providing the forum for important, broader uh, discussions and engagement on European and international issues, uh, which is to the benefit of, of our wider our public, and uh, I thank the Institute for its, its ongoing endeavors. Um, I can be uh, briefer than the previous two speakers and allow time for, for question and answer and discussion, um, because um, the government's position was recently set out comprehensively by Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Charlie Flanagan, at a recent specially convened meeting of the Council of Europe, which took place in Strasbourg on the 7th of September. Um, only a handful of foreign ministers uh, attended. Uh, Minister Flanagan was one of them. And the Turkish foreign minister was also present for the meeting. And so it meant that there was a direct engagement, uh, which I think was very important, uh, both in terms of uh, conveying messages, but also in terms of, of, uh, of uh, making sure that uh, the kind of conversations that are important that the European Union has with its partner countries uh, take place uh, in, in accordance with the agreements and rules which we've all uh, agreed to, and in this case, the Council of Europe. Um, the weekend before, Minister Flanagan was also at the informal meeting of foreign ministers, the Gimnik, which took place in Bratislava and the Turkish Minister for European Affairs attended that meeting. And similarly, there was, if I can use the diplomatic description, robust engagement between EU foreign ministers and, and the Turkish Minister for Europe. Um, and I think I'll come back at the end to, to the importance of, of, of the word engagement in this context. Uh, the main points that Minister Flanagan made on these occasions uh, uh, were, were uh, fairly clear. Obviously, uh, the attempted coup on the 15th of July was a criminal act and a direct attack on democracy in Turkey. And the minister expressed solidarity and sympathy with the Turkish people 
um, and condemned also the spate of recent terrorist attacks. I think the, the situation in Turkey is so complex that we're talking about some specific aspects of the situation, but obviously the terrorist attacks that Turkey has suffered this last year and the large number of casualties are also a matter of, of international concern. Um, the minister was clear that Ireland supports a stable and democratic Turkey. Um, and he was very clear that we remain concerned that in the post-coup situation, some of the actions being taken are contrary to democratic norms. The minister summarized these in terms of the large numbers of people detained or suspended from their jobs, whether they be judges, lawyers, teachers, academics, trade unionists, business leaders, uh, the closure of media outlets as well as the reported conditions in which those allegedly involved in the coup were being detained, that these were all matters of concern. Uh, the minister was also clear that it was critical that legal processes uh, take place under the presumption of innocence uh, and that the core principles of human rights, including freedom of expression and of the media, which are at the heart of the conventions which we've all signed up to, uh, need to be respected. The human rights and basic freedoms of minorities, including the Kurdish minority, were also core principles that we've agreed to Turkey and the other members of the Council of Europe. Uh, the minister said that we understand, and both in Ireland and at the European Union level, that Turkey is going through a difficult time, uh, but that as friends we were saying to Turkey that it's important that they use the supports and tools that the Council of Europe provide, uh, and also um, that they work with uh, the European Union in terms of the accession process uh, in meeting benchmarks and criteria that are necessary. Um, the minister was clear that Ireland has been and remains a firm supporter of Turkish accession to the Union, um, but that obviously accession means meeting clear benchmarks and criteria. Um, and uh, Simon mentioned the annual reports, um, and clearly before the coup there are concerns about the direction of travel in Turkey, which, which the minister and the Taoiseach have spoken about previously. Uh, but obviously the post-coup situation puts a whole other dimension in terms of those concerns. Uh, the minister said we want to encourage Turkey to deal with the post-coup situation in a way that strengthens democracy and the rule of law. Uh, we support Turkey in that regard. Um, the minister also made clear um, Ireland's wish uh, that the government of Turkey would restart the political process with the democratic representatives of the Kurds. Uh, and a view that this is a view that was uh, stated by many EU ministers in both discussions in the Gimnik and in uh, the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. Um, that kind of summary um, is, is short, but there's a lot of, 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 of important detail and, and content there. But it comes down, and this really, I suppose, leads into the question and answer session uh, to um, the EU's approach and engagement with Turkey. And I think um, at this point in time, uh, the approach that Simon mentioned at the outset of engagement, engagement, engagement is the only uh, really uh, serious policy option that the European Union has in relation to uh, Turkey. Turkey is a strategic partner. Uh, the importance of its uh, strategic engagement with Europe uh, predates the migration crisis. The migration crisis adds a whole other dimension to it. Uh, but um, irrespective of that, uh, the long-term direction of uh, engagement in Europe um, is going to benefit better from a policy of engagement than any other approach at this time. Um, I think an example of, of that, um, which again, you could think it could be debated, but in the immediate aftermath of the coup, uh, when there was some discussion about reinstating the death penalty in Turkey, uh, Minister Flanagan, many other European ministers, the Commission, uh, Vice President and uh, High Representative Margarini made very clear in public statements uh, in, in the clearest of terms that any consideration of a return to the death penalty would uh, be uh, very detrimental to Turkey's relationship with the European Union. And in the period since then, that issue has dropped off the agenda. Uh, there are many other issues of concern, but I think uh, that is just one simple example of um, cl clear uh, engagement on, on the part of the European Union, uh, which uh, had some impact in terms of the immediate consideration of options that were under discussion within Turkey. 
Um, I think I can leave it at that um, and happy to, to participate in the questions and answers. Um, but I would underline the uh, importance of engagement, not uh, least for the future uh, uh, interests and concerns of the people of Turkey. Um, if one takes the long view, Turkey has been on a, a, an interesting uh, journey. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, the decision of the European Union to enter into enlargement negotiations with Turkey, uh, as mentioned, is 11 years old at this stage in terms of the launch of, of the accession process. Um, it's very clear that any such process still, ha still has, and in light of, of recent developments, a considerable way to go. But the actual process of engagement uh, on all of the range of issues that accession covers provides the European Union and uh, Turkey with the framework for uh, serious engagement uh, for a long time to come. And I think um, the alternative to engagement uh, is not going to actually achieve uh, what uh, uh, much compared to what engagement has the possibility of achieving uh, while accepting that the current circumstances are not an, any that we would wish. Thank you very much.